So, relationship, uh, love, basis of human life. Now this experience of gift, this fortuity, plays itself out in the interdependence that makes our lives possible. This is a key theme that he's going to go back to over and over again. Interdependence. From the air we breathe, to the culture in which we function, from the history of which we are a part, to the practicalities of where our food, clothing, and shelter come from, for those of you who are having lunch now. We are completely interdependent on others whose gift to us is not something that we've earned or won, but given to us by our world. Recognizing this interdependence is part of what makes our humanity integral. Okay, so we've got integral human. Of course, we each make our contribution to the mix, but to pretend that that contribution means that I have earned and therefore own in some sense, all that has made my life possible is one of the great illusions of our time. But I'm getting it out of myself. Love and relationship, thirdly, love and relationship always moves the human person out of herself, beyond herself, always improving, stretching, transcending oneself. <laughs> it is this most basic characteristic of human life, this, this self-transcendence that love calls us to, that Benedict calls development. Development. Self-development comes about by participation in the development of our world in which we live. It is the human vocation. Thus, for Benedict, love and development are intimately linked because they are both part, they are both at the heart of the human project. So, love, so, love, Engaging this interdependent humanity in our journey towards transcendence. Love, humanity, interdependence, transcendence. That's what we mean by integral human development. This emphasis on love is at the heart of the church's social doctrine, and it is one of Benedict's stamps on that Catholic social teaching. He integrates it, of course, with concepts that have been emphasized by others, justice, solidarity, liberation, charity, but his focus on love, which of course he began with his first encyclical, God is love, is, I think, a, a fresh perspective. Now, while we all nod in assent to this, you know, yes, love is a really important thing, we appreciate this picture of the world in which love is at its core, we probably can't help rolling our eyes just a little bit. Because this view of the world contradicts the view that in the words that I love of uh, General Congregation 34 of the Jesuits. Because of the view that passes through the heart of each one of us. <coughs> which is the view that it's not love, but it's self-interest. That is the basic human instinct and the basic drive. Whether we like it or not, this worldview would say, well, that's who we are. Nothing like we don't know. Our relationships are best governed by the famous phrase, trust. But verify. We grow only by our own self-improvement and not so much by the improvement of others. Is this worldview. And the fact that we have let ourselves believe this fallacy and build much of our lives and our social rules around it is part of the truth that Benedict wants us to understand. Love for better, not self-interest, is really what drives human life, whether we know it or not. The second reality that it points to, truth, is at least in part simply the practical reality. It is the context for our loving human life. It's the, in Benedict's words, locus of charity. It's the recognition and the reminder that love is incarnational. That the, only, that the only presence of God that we actually have is that presence of God in our flesh and blood human history. And only if our love is truly engaged with that reality will it avoid being what Benedict calls mere sentimentality. And the truth of our human history 
at least since Pokemon Progressio, at least since the progress of peoples, uh, that Benedict is addressing is not pretty. The 40 years since uh, the progress of peoples has been disappointing. While there certainly has been growth, economic growth since 1967, particularly in China and in India, where billions of people have been lifted out of misery, Benedict points out that in much of the rest of the world, this growth is weighed down by malfunctions, dramatic problems, and highlighted even further by the current economic crisis. The scandal of inequality that Paul VI pointed out is on the increase, not the decrease, showing that mere technical progress does not has not resolved the true issues of human advancement. The sad reality of this, of course, is that this is the age of globalization. This is the age in which relationships among the human family is so much clearer than it's ever been before. It's played out daily in our media, positively and negatively. Yet this clarity about <coughs> our interrelationships, our interdependence, has not yielded the kind of progress in human development that Paul VI hoped for 40 years ago. This, of course, is not only the view of Benedict and Catholic social teaching. Many others see poverty and inequality in our world as a scandal, an offense against humanity. The debate is really about the causes and the responses. So for Benedict, since all human activity is well leading to human development, the successes and the failures of economic human activity are rooted in love or it's black. That is to say, they have a moral dimension, a moral imperative. He says that the economic sphere is part and parcel, he reminds us, the economic sphere is part and parcel of human activity and must be structured and governed in an ethical manner. And in particular, is the hook, in particular, many situations of underdevelopment are not due to chance nor to historical necessity. They are attributable to human responsibility. Again, this is not unique to Catholic social teaching. Just you think of Peter Singer's example, the philosopher Peter Singer recently, uh, who's a relatively famous book now, comparing our res moral responsibility for a nearby child who's drowning in a pond with that of a faraway child who's dying of malnutrition. The problem, of course, is that we do not see, at least not clearly, the child in Haiti or Ethiopia or India, and so we are not moved to act. In addition, Catholic social teaching calls us not only to see the impoverished, but to see how the world looks like through their eyes. And it reminds us that if we do not learn from, attempt to see the world from the perspective of the marginalized, we are not seeing the world. At least we're not seeing it in its whole picture. And not seeing the world is one of the things that leads us astray in our moral responsibilities. For me, an example of the power and the uncomfortableness that seeing the world through the eyes of the marginalized can bring is Michael Moore's recent movie, Capitalism, a Love Story. I don't know how many of you have seen it. Classic Michael Moore kind of picture. Obviously, it is no more the whole story than is our own more comfortable view. But having sat in a theater in Oakland with folks who look to me like community organizers and the impoverished with whom they work, I can tell you that it is a view of the world that many folks, many of the folks in that theater, <coughs> saw as more accurate than what. My classmate, you did the Wall Street Journal. 